I'm Patrick Letty, and this is Selling Made Human. In this episode, I'm going to show you how I went from Burger King to Business Insider Top 15 Startup Globally. This is my personal story of grit, determination, and the four pillars that made all of this possible. We have a lot to cover today, so let's jump straight in. Now, before we go into the four pillars, I want to give you a little bit of a background on me and why I got into business. I was stuck in a nine to five job in my very early 20s, didn't enjoy it, couldn't express my creativity. And that was really the main reason for for leaving my job. So I wanted more freedom. That was time and location freedom. And I also wanted to express my creativity. That's one of the coolest things I think about business is that we get to and it can be frustrating at times. It can be really challenging. We can get very down on ourselves. Um, but you get to be creative, okay? So that's something that is a major benefit um, over working for someone else. And that was my primary reason, not the money. It was in it to be creative, to use all of my skills to the fullest into the way that I wanted to use them. But often in these early businesses in the first few years, your your dreams and how you thought that business was going to look ends up being very disconnected uh, to the reality of the situation. And in the early days, it's hard to get attention. It's hard to stand out, get leads and get clients. And that's really where I was. I was struggling. And this left me feeling very, very frustrated, extremely overwhelmed with the process. And I ended up actually going through a lot of like rumination, a lot of negative self-talk. I'd beat myself up. Entrepreneurs kind of end up being um, hard on themselves. I don't know if you've uh, you've noticed that, um, but I've worked with quite a few entrepreneurs. I'm friends with a lot of entrepreneurs nearly my entire circle are running are running businesses they're very hard on themselves as, as people they're very conscientious and when things don't go well you kind of end up beating yourself up a little bit more than you should now the thing is like 96 percent or something of all businesses fail but they don't fail in the first year they fail in the first three years so a lot of people end up actually limping along for two or three years and then when they're actually earning less money than they did in their job and that, you know, they haven't got clients and it's been a couple of years, that's kind of when they end up throwing in the towel. And I was very close to throwing in the towel in this business. So I didn't work in Burger King. Our office was above a Burger King. It was the cheapest office space I could find in Dublin, Ireland. We had all this burger aroma and grease enter the building every every five minutes. It was terrible. We couldn't bring clients in. Our clothes literally smelled like burgers. And it was very frustrating, very frustrating trying to get clients. And we didn't realize this at the time, but we were stuck in something called the Red Ocean. Now, you may have heard this before. I'm going to elaborate on this concept and explain a little bit about some of the the competitive dynamics. So essentially, we we had this like me too business. So we were a me too business stuck in the red ocean. And that meant that we had the same offer as everyone else. We had a suspiciously similar website to our competitors. We said if our competitors have a homepage and about page, and what makes us different page, ironically, let's like list out similar things. Let's make our sales copy similar to them. Let's have a similar company name because if that's what made them successful, well, then maybe it can make us successful as well. And a lot of business owners end up looking too closely at the competition. They end up copying them a little bit too much. So they end up with, you know, too similar of an offer, a similar copy, similar boring name, and really no differencing factors in the business at all. So you end up just looking the same, so sounding the same, and this is uh, this is essentially the sea of sameness, where most of your customers, potential customers, just see you as everyone else, and they can't, they lack the sophistication to tell you apart from your competitors. And what this does is it means that people are just looking for the cheapest option if they can't find anything that is unique about your business. So we we didn't stand out. We looked the same, we sounded the same, and we had the same offer. We had basically carbon copied our competitors' websites who were also in the web design business. So when we would go and pitch for business, um, we just looked like everyone else. There was nothing really compelling about our pitch. And often our strategy to win was actually by being the cheapest. Okay, so we were fighting this price war. It was a race to the bottom. That's a position that you really never want to be in. And 
I was terrible at marketing at this stage. I was a, a, a programmer. This is 20 years ago. So I was a programmer and I didn't know anything about sales and marketing. I, I found it very difficult to get clients. I couldn't catch a cold to save my life. And I mean that in the sales uh, context. No one wanted to do business with us. We were cheap. We built kind of mediocre quality websites probably at this point. And the marketing just wasn't differentiated at all. Now, I'm going to show you today the four pillars that you can implement to move from a red ocean space into a blue ocean space. Now, we now operate and we've had a great deal of success in our businesses. And we've gone through various ups and downs on our journey to that. And I'm going to maybe explain on this podcast what those ups and downs have been, both professionally and also personally as well. There's some really interesting things to cover. However, the blue ocean is a space when you operate in here with your business. That's a very bad stick character there. Let me draw that. Now, for those who are listening to the podcast on Spotify or Apple or Google, you'll get great value from today. But don't forget to go to sellingmadehuman.com to get the sketch file, because I'm also live on YouTube here sketching this out. And you can get the full sketch file and the bonuses and worksheets that come with this by going to sellingmadehuman.com. It's totally free. So the blue ocean is a space where you can actually charge. OK, let me underline this. You can charge and you can get premium prices. It's also a place where competitors are irrelevant. And you might say, well, that sounds fanciful. How could I make my competitors irrelevant? How would that ever be possible? Surely in every market, there are companies competing for the same business. And that is true, usually, but there are things that you can do to stand out. And yes, no matter how difficult you have been finding it right now to stand out, to get leads and to create clients, I promise you, if you implement what I'm showing you here today, you can move from the red ocean to the blue ocean. And it doesn't matter how competitive your market is right now. It doesn't matter how busy it is right now. This will work and this works in hyper competitive markets. So as I said, the blue ocean a place where you can charge and command premium prices, a place where your competitors become irrelevant and a place where customers are actively seeking you out. So you're not actually doing this push marketing, okay, like in the previous example, but you have clients that are actively coming to you and that are actively seeking you out because they recognize your differentiators and you've actually discovered a gap in the market and you have bridged that gap with an innovative solution. And you can do that in hyper competitive, hyper busy markets. What you can do by doing a little bit of research, and I will be covering this in future podcasts, my entire process for doing both market research and also customer research. Hint, it involves a phone call with customers. It's really feel good. And you end up getting some amazing insights. It's not about churning through data, and Excel spreadsheets. It's all about having conversations. This is Selling Made Human. And that's how we roll. So I'll be unpacking that in a later podcast. Stay tuned for our market research um, episode and segment that will show you how to find gaps in the market. This is a little bit more of a high level. So imagine here that you've done a little bit of research and you've identified product gaps, service gaps, pain gaps. They are in every single market. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you offer, what your niche is, or if maybe if you don't have a niche, maybe you're op op uh, operating in wealth, relationships, or health, which are kind of like the main three markets. And then a lot of the niche markets kind of uh, are, are within that. So as I said, customers are actively seeking you out because they see you as holding the key to something very special that no one else has. No other business has this. And you've also gone out with your own flavor of education based marketing, and you essentially have um, led them in your direction. So some really cool stuff that we're going to be unpacking here, how to move from the red ocean space where you have the same offer, look the same, sound the same, and, and essentially deliver the same thing to actually delivering something quite different from your customers, things that your competitors have completely overlooked, and customers don't even really know they need until they see it. And they're like, Oh, wow, that's exactly what I need. That's exactly what I need. I haven't tried that before. That's brand new. Um, this is a compelling new opportunity for me to achieve success and avoid pain. And this is like, unlike anything I've tried before, 
and possibly the absence of this product service or methodology in my life has actually been the reason for past failures. Okay, so I want to talk for a second a little bit about creating uh, serendipity in, in business. And on this podcast, I have quite a few serendipitous stories to uh, unpack for you and a few kind of things where we, you know, quote unquote, got lucky. And I don't really believe in luck. I think that luck is, um, you know, opportunity meets preparation. So if you're not prepared and the opportunity comes across your desk or you meet someone and you haven't really laid the groundwork, they're not going to take you on. They're not going to be impressed by you. They may not give you a second look. But what we did is we kept moving, we prepared, and then we ended up meeting some people and that was where we were able to kind of create our own look. We got some opportunities. We were able to engineer serendipity in our business. And we have a lot of stories, some really interesting things that I will cover um, a little bit later and also on future episodes. But today, I want to talk about the very core serendipitous moment that happened for me a long time ago that ended up kind of breaking out of this Burger King office this stuffy web design business where we couldn't get leads, where we couldn't get clients, where we couldn't stand out, and how I actually really got on the path to where I am today, which is where we're actually teaching everything that we have learned, having gone through and exited successful businesses and built multi-million dollar software and coaching businesses. Um, so let's jump in. So three years into my first business, it was called Web Splash, by the way. I can't even remember why we called it that, but it had a very kind of a blend in name. So I was three years in, very, very close to throwing in the towel. Um, cash flow was a major, major problem. And I remember there was a business networking event in Dublin, Ireland. And I said, look, I'm not really into network into networking. Back then, I had a little bit of social anxiety. I didn't really like the way I looked. I was a little bit overweight. And I was also reasonably young. But I said, look, go to this business networking event and try to get some clients. Try to do something different than the cold calling that I had been doing and sending out email campaigns, basically, just cold emails. So I gave myself an ultimatum. You either go to this business networking event and get a client or start to get maybe several clients if possible and you start putting yourself out there. And if you can't do that, well, then it is time to, unfortunately, after three years, shut the business down and go back to your web design job working in, in the agency. So faced with that, I said, OK, I'm going to go to the networking event. I went and spoiler alert, I didn't get any clients. So how am I still here today? So at the networking event, whilst I didn't meet any potential clients, I did meet someone very special that ended up changing the trajectory of my life and business. And it was a guy called Darren Stanley. He was an Irish entrepreneur, a very successful Irish entrepreneur. He had exited three businesses and he had built them using something called education-based marketing. Now, this is not the typical type of education-based marketing that you see everywhere. This is something quite different and I, I'm going to unpack that in today's episode. So I stood there sipping coffee with Darren. He was asking me a little bit about my business. I was telling him how well it was going. I think he saw through that very, very quickly. And he said, look, seems like you're having a few problems. Why don't we sit down here and sketch this out on a napkin? And he started giving me some ideas on basically how I could grow my business. Now, at that time, he had created his first business training and marketing program. He had his own success in business. And this was his first foray into the world of actually helping other entrepreneurs to scale and giving back to the community and helping early stage entrepreneurs. Now, it came with a price tag. It was actually more than I could afford back then. But I got so much out of this first session with Darren. We spent 30 minutes sketching out things together. I had a number of insights and I had a number of ahas that I took away on this napkin and I actually started to implement and I started feeling better about my business. And I actually started to make a little bit of headway. I started to see very small results even within that time frame. So a week later, I was thinking, wow, you know, if in 30 minutes we were able to achieve that and if his advice was so good, you know, imagine if I worked with him on this expensive coaching program that he offered, what would be possible? So I'd been saying this for a long time that I needed help, that I needed to learn marketing, that I needed a business mentor. And I'd been saying I should for a very, very long time. So I slept on it. 
And the next morning, the should became a must. I picked up the phone and I hired Darren. Took a few days to get the bank loan. I drew down a $15,000 in the euro equivalent bank loan. That was my first ever bank loan. And I wired the money to Darren. Very quickly, we got to work. And straight away, he identified four barriers, four blocks, four deadly mistakes, as he put them, that I needed to completely stop doing in my business. And I want to relate these here to you today. Let's bring up this here on the screen and break this down one by one. Now, it turns out that there are four things that you can do in replacement to each of these mistakes. And that's basically what the four pillars are. A lot of businesses are doing these things. And this was true. This was true 20 years ago. And it's also true today in terms of it's pretty fundamental to business. It's also fundamental to the mistakes a lot of early stage entrepreneurs make because there's a lot of options. There are lots of different ways of doing things. So you can get very confused. You can end up trying too many different things. And these mistakes are so typical. Five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and today people still make these mistakes. So this is going to be hugely valuable. Let's go down through this now and unpack it. And then let's look at how we actually fix each of these four deadly mistakes. So the first one here is using saturated formats. Okay, so what could that be? Using saturated formats. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll, 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 we'll break that down in just a second. Number two, trying too many channels at once. Okay, maybe slightly more self-explanatory, but uh, let's um, leave that there just for a moment. Now, this one you probably won't get. Feeding the content monster. What could that be? Feeding the content monster. And then we have cheap offers plus the value ladder. Now, you may have heard the value ladder before. You may not have heard of it. We will talk about that later. And as I've said, uh, Darren gave me the four pillars that basically correct for these four mistakes. He made them in his early stage businesses. It set him back by years. I was set back by three years initially. So we will be covering this later. I'm going to show you the four pillars that essentially eliminate, let me change the color here, that essentially eliminate each of these mistakes. All right. So what are saturated formats and why is it a mistake to use saturated formats? So first of all, what I was doing in my business now, if we go back to, to that time period, the saturated formats of the time were quite different to what is saturated today in 2023. Very, very different. But what I was trying back then, a lot of other marketers and a lot of other business people were using those formats as well. So it was hard for me to cut through the noise because they were recognized as marketing mechanisms, not as useful education, utility-based, tool-based things that people found useful, it was seen as an annoyance. So things like sending cold email, things like cold calling, and even doorstepping businesses. I went into physical businesses in Dublin, believe it or not, went in and to reception and asked to kind of like speak to the manager. And that was one of the ways that we tried to generate business. But there were other people doing that at the time. And a few other things that I won't go into because it's not relevant in today's day and age. So I'll just tell you, to be more useful in this episode, I'll tell you what is actually saturated today. So right now, webinars are ultra saturated. And the reason for that is that people see them as sales tools, not as educational formats that they can learn from and maybe, you know, achieve something with. They're really just seen as sales tools. The same with funnels. Funnels are just seen as a way of very quickly selling low ticket offers, making a little bit of money, a lot of these annoying pop ups, um, you know, the ones I'm talking about, the order bumps, the one click upsells with the countdown timers and all of those things. And then launches, launches is really, really um, saturated at this point, which is about a timeline that is important for your business, but doesn't really pay respect to the internal timeline that the customer is operating on. So you're launching once a year, or once a quarter, and people have to buy when you're ready, not when they're ready. And of course, people make decisions based on internal reasons. So when they're ready, they will be basically ready to buy. And that's the ideal time to sell to them, not to manipulate them into buying during your launch because of FOMO. Now, I will be showing you in just a moment, in about five minutes, 
I'm going to be showing you a content strategy that is the opposite of one of the mistakes, which is feeding the content monster, which actually creates this internal urgency in your prospects at a very deep level. So there's no superficiality to it. It's actually quite ethical. And that is the best way, FYI, just to generate a um, a prompt. We'll come, we'll come to this in future episodes. I, I will be breaking down the BJ Fogg um, model of uh, prompt behavior and ability, which is in psychology, what causes people to act and do certain things from getting your morning coffee to buying a course, a software, signing up for a coaching program, things like that. But I digress. All right. So these are very saturated formats. I was using similar things, similar but different things because it was 20 years ago and um, back in the day. And people just saw those as things that were, you know, really, um, you know, really quite, I wouldn't say boring, but used for marketing. So they were seen as marketing tools and gimmicks, not as helpful. So what's the what's the next best thing? So what do we do? So how do we fix this if we have saturated formats? So instead of using saturated formats, try experimenting with new formats. And that, that might seem overly obvious, but you might say, well, well, what would those new formats be? And there are a lot of new formats out there, to be honest. You just have to discover them. You have to do a little bit of research. And it's about moving away from the lazy world of funnels and webinars and launches and kind of quite scammy, uh, spammy email campaigns and moving towards these newer formats that I've mentioned here. So I'll give you some examples of new formats that you can research yourself and experiment with. One might be whiteboard videos. Now, kind of what I'm doing here is a little bit like a whiteboard video, except it's more of a blackboard video, but you could literally have a real whiteboard behind you. You could shoot yourself, you could have a, a real physical marker, and you could draw things out on the whiteboard and explain them. And that's different to a PowerPoint presentation, which is overdone and different to a webinar, which is overdone because they get to see the real you. And there are no slides, you're actually drawing things. And that's something that actually is quite durable over time. People really do like this format. It's worked well in the past. And it's also coming back into vogue video podcasts are big right now. So think of Selling Made Human and what we are doing. And if you watch the first episode, you'll see our motivation for doing Selling Made Human. We actually broke down our full content strategy and marketing strategy behind it. Also live workshops, really connecting with people, building rapport, getting in front of them, teaching them. Interactive lectures of some kind where it's recorded, but unlike a webinar, people can actually interact with the videos, ask questions, kind of choose their own adventure. And of course, we also have video quiz funnels. Um, and that one, of course, full disclosure, we do sell a software that does video quiz funnels. So we are biased <laughs> clearly in saying that. So the overriding principle or idea here is to essentially become the face of your business. If you can become the face of your business and build trust and build rapport and show people that you can help them by actually helping them first before money changes hands, what a great opportunity for you to stand out and out teach the competition. I talked about that in episode one. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit today, but in the next episode, we're going to break that down in huge detail and give you a full strategy to completely out teach your competitors. I can't wait for that one. Okay. Cool. So we have kind of addressed at a high level the using saturated formats. So we're making great progress. And um, the next is trying too many channels at once. So what do I what do I mean by that? So trying too many channels at once. So I want you to imagine for a second that this line here, or this circle rather, this represents your focus. Um, I believe you can do anything. We're all capable of amazing things. We can do anything, but we can't do everything and we shouldn't try to do everything at once. So this is a very typical problem that entrepreneurs fall into. And it was also a huge issue for me back then. So Darren pointed out that I was trying like literally like 15 different traction channels in order to get customers of which none of them were working. So in your business, if you're doing, let's say, Facebook ads, so let's say you're doing Facebook ads. Well, then suddenly we have your attention going this way. Then let's say you also have Google ads in your business and you've got your attention going this way. Now, we used Google ads because Facebook ads really weren't a thing back then, it didn't exist. So we were using Google ads, but we were also trying all of these other traction channels. But these are the traction channels 
in today's world. And that's why I wanted to list these out to be most helpful. So if you're doing Twitter, you're also going off in this other direction. Then if you've got Pinterest, you've got another direction. And then if you're doing content posting, you're over here, social media, you're over here. And then you're trying a little bit of outbound that could be cold email or some other form of outbound, maybe on LinkedIn or something like that. And what this does is it actually splits your uh, your focus and attention in so many different directions that it actually kind of just burns you out and you can't become an expert at any one of these individual channels. So you really end up being an overachiever, but not in the good way. You're overachieving, but underperforming. So all of your traction channels, um, they kind of suck, to be honest, because you're just not an expert at each of them. And as a small team, as a small company, maybe as a solo entrepreneur, you can't be an expert at all of these things and you can't manage all of these things. It comes with huge operational drag. So that that's what I was doing. I had all of these traction channels and what we did is we basically just removed all of them and we focused on one channel. So if you're running too many channels right now, consider killing all of them um, or most of them. And instead, my recommendation to you, and this is what Darren did with me, is he helped me focus in on one channel, one single way of getting customers that actually works, becoming an expert at it, really putting in the time and effort and the focus to bring customers in in this one direction. And for me, it was paid advertising. And back then we chose Google pay per click. It ended up being um, really, really successful pay per click. Once I learned pay per click and Darren showed me how he had used it in his business and we invested thousands, we had to invest thousands in it, it started to slowly but surely produce returns. And then it became the best way that we get clients. Now for you, it's likely that paid advertising, although it might make you feel uncomfortable, is actually the best way for you to get started and start ramping up clients. Because right now, it's very difficult to compete on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook for attention. Unless you have an audience already of hundreds of thousands and you post world-class content, you do it every day or very regularly, the algorithms are probably not going to show your content. Now, if you start creating content today, and I think you should, it's great for nurturing your list and your existing audience, but it's probably not going to help you get customers because the algorithm isn't going to show your content to new people. And that's why I say creating content right now is great for lead generation. But if you do a great job of your content in the long run and think in like long quantums of time, think of like 18 months, eventually your organic content, as it gets better, as you have more of it, as it starts to rank, it will actually start bringing in traffic and customers. But the problem is you likely need clients, customers, and sales today. So paid advertising is actually the best way to do that because you can just pay for that attention instead of actually trying to earn that attention on social media, which will take a long time. So the best way is actually paid advertising in the beginning once you do it right and follow a correct strategy. But one of the reasons that it's the best way um, when you get going is it's, it's kind of like the easiest way because you just pay money and the ads will be put uh, in front of people. There's also much less competition compared with the organic content, right? There's tons of organic content out there. If you're going to be an or organic content creator, you are literally competing with millions of people. Whereas the, with Facebook ads, you will only be completing, competing with thousands of people in your sector, uh, likely. There's also a huge opportunity to stand out using a very simple advertising uh, strategy that I am going to show you. And we're going to un unpack that in a lot of detail in a future episode. It involves making your ads useful. Imagine if every ad out there was useful. People keep useful. So we have ads that have a high utility value, ads that teach that are so valuable that people want to click and they want to actually learn uh, more. So if we make our advertising strategy useful, we create great content in the ad you know, it's going to actually also bring in leads and clients on a daily basis. And that's whether you're working or you're on the beach. Okay, so sometimes we don't feel like doing things in our business. We get up, we've slept badly. We don't, you know, we have low energy on a certain day. We're all human. You know, it's hard to take consistent action when biologically our inner state, energetically and otherwise is fluctuating. The thing about paid ads is once you set them up and you keep paying, 
the ads keep running. So those ads will keep serving. You'll get impressions, you will get leads, and you will get clients every day, no matter how you feel. But whether you're doing or when you're doing organic content posting, how you feel is going to affect your consistency a lot in terms of how often you post. So paid advertising really gets uh, away from that. So we end up not getting stuck in this hamster wheel, essentially, of creating content every single week. You don't have to spend a fortune either. I'm not talking about spending thousands. You can literally get started on Facebook ads for $20 a day. We've got some great stuff inside sellingmadehuman.com, which is our community and course that shows you kind of like how to do this at a much deeper level. Okay, cool. So what we've done is we've talked about the saturated formats that I was using, how I got away from using saturated formats. Uh, I actually showed up in person. I started doing in-person events. I started doing workshops. I started teaching. I started lecturing. I started speaking from the stage. And then eventually I started doing video. So we actually had a business YouTube channel uh, way before it was cool to do YouTube at all. So we were doing YouTube in the very, very early days when it was almost strange to put business content on, on, on YouTube. Okay, so we've dealt with uh, the saturated formats. We've talked about trying too many traction channels at once and how that can really split our attention out and how we really want to have our attention going in one direction. Okay, so that's the kind of the contrast there between the two is you're going in every direction and now you've got your you've got your energy, you've got your focus, you've got your attention and your ad money all going in one direction, one channel. And these are the reasons, as I've mentioned, why paid advertising can be um, super uh, useful at getting clients in the early stages. And then the organic content can really take off from there 18 months into your business. But get clients today using paid advertising. And even though we have a lot of content now, we still run paid ads because they work. Why would we turn them off? Okay, cool. So we've dealt with the saturated formats. We've dealt with trying too many channels at once. Next up, what I want to talk about is feeding the content monster. You may have been curious as to what this actually is. And let's go and do it now. So here's what I mean by feeding the content monster. And the thing is, there's a lot of this generic content out there on the internet. Okay, so open up Instagram, open up YouTube, watch a video. Okay, it's very likely that what you've just watched and consumed, you already know. You've seen it before, you've heard it before, and it's already widely accepted what that person is saying. So they're not really adding much to the world and they're not getting you to think differently about yourself or your situation. The content is not frame breaking. The majority of content out there is highly generic. It's generic content. It's been done before, it's been said before, it's photocopied or it's rehashed content. And that is bad because you end up blending in. Okay, so that's heading down into the negative leads, negative attention attributes, you end up just blending in. And the other problem with generic content is that it doesn't cause prospects to act. Okay, people say, Oh, that's interesting. I remember someone else said that before. I think I've heard that before. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you for that useful bit of information. And now I'm going to go, uh, you know, about my day and it leaves your mind and you don't think differently about the company or yourself, you don't really stop for a second. It doesn't stop them in their tracks and cause them to, to think differently. So a lot of businesses are out there producing what is called thought leadership content. And they're trying to stay top of mind with people by giving little useful tidbits of information, little facts, factoids, interesting things, quotes, and they're doing this kind of to stay top of mind with their market. And by the way, staying top of mind is important. It's really important in marketing, but you should stay top of mind using a different type of content and content marketing that is frame breaking. Because thought leadership, while it will help you stay top of mind, people keep seeing it and consuming it, but it doesn't cause an internal shift. It really is not compelling enough. It's not frame breaking. People see it and they're like, ah, yeah, I've seen that before. Oh, that was useful. Thanks. Not going to change. Not going to change my patterns. Not going to change my behaviors. It simply leaves people saying, huh, well, that was interesting. Thank you. And we don't want people saying that. We want people saying, I need to change. Wow, that bit of content 
that video. That's really helped me to think differently about my situation. They've really shined the spotlight for me on the truth of my situation. I didn't know this before. I didn't know that what I'm doing is actually totally wrong and is actually pushing me further away from the success that I want. So think about this. If your competitors could reasonably say it, well, then it isn't unique or compelling. So if your competitors could reasonably say the same thing, okay? So if there's a way that what you're saying right now, if you think, well, my competitors could kind of say something similar to that, there's nothing stopping them. In fact, they routinely say things similar to this and I say things similar to them and the content is not thematically linked. It's not frame breaking. It doesn't lead people down an ever increasing awareness of thinking differently about their problem so that eventually they think differently about the company, but more coming on that uh, later and more coming indeed in episode in the next episode on how to really think about building a structure out of this um, in your business. Okay, so next up, let's talk about how we move away from this uh, feeding of the content monster and what is the solution. Okay, now I've given you part of the solution already, so it's kind of obvious, but instead of feeding the content monster, we really should try creating frame breaking content. This means that we're giving customers an aha moment. This is the most powerful marketing strategy on earth. It is also the most misunderstood and it is the most underutilized, leaving the door wide open for you and I to out teach the competition and give customers insights. And the thing is, the thing is that these aha moments end up being thematically linked and they create an ever increasing awareness of the problem and why they should solve the problem now and how if they don't solve the problem, all of the bad things that are going to happen, that could be emotionally, physically, financially. And what we're doing is we're really just revealing the truth of the situation to them. You know, think about this for a second. Here's a question. What do your prospects misunderstood or what do your prospects not understand about their situation, but should? So what are your prospects overlooking about their situation? What is the dogma in your industry where all of your competitors and industry peers are teaching your customers in a certain direction? And that's often wrong, out of date, invalid advice that actually keeps the customer stuck. Think about that for a second. Maybe jot down a few notes and also let me know in the comments below uh, what that is for your particular business or industry. So the, the challenge is then, to not create more content and to, instead of feeding the content monster, to create a much smaller amount of frame breaking content that is thematically linked. And as I just underlined there, less is actually more. So create content that challenges and refines the way prospects think. Provide them with a series of aha moments and make them realize that they need to change their current approach and they need to change that current approach basically now, not later. And that gets them to say, wow, I'm, I'm not just up to my ankle in problems. I'm actually up to my neck. I'm out in the middle of the lake. I'm drowning and I need a new and better way. So what actually happens here is we take the customer's A-frame. So this is about kind of like shifting beliefs now. And we want to get customers from the A-frame into what is called the B-frame. Now, a lot of marketers build their whole businesses on B-frames. It's all about selling the outcome and selling the future. And life will be great when you buy our product or service. They sell like the future of the product. But in the marketing, they don't really do a very good job of agitating the customer's A-frame, the current situation, the pain of the same, the pain of the status quo, all of the things that they're doing that are outdated and that are wrong. So customers say, wow, I'm not just up to my ankle, I'm up to my neck. I really need to change what I'm doing or this is going to be a lot worse than I previously thought. And wow, I really need to change now. And I'm going to try this, this new way. I'm going to try this new way of doing things that this company has uh, thought me about. And because I can try these things for free and this kind of mimics the pattern of all good TED Talks, if you watch one, they show you 
everything you know about this topic is wrong and here's why and here's a better way of doing it and here's what happens when you follow the new way and here's what will happen if you follow the old way and all the consequences of staying in the old way and they give you the new way kind of for free and you try that and you're like wow what a great speaker you follow them on twitter you subscribe to their emails and then later you might be like wow they've like really helped illuminate the truth about the situation for me they've opened my eyes I've already experienced wins from trying their free content. Now I want to do the full, I want to go the whole way. I want to actually achieve my complete outcome. Well, then you're going to really value uh, that company's uniqueness and differentiators as the best way of getting there. So we smash the A-frame, you completely break the A-frame and then customers realize they need to change. And then you don't need any deadlines anymore. Um, you don't need any launches where you force customers to buy on your schedule. Don't get me back into the saturated formats again, but that's essentially what I mean. So again, I will be breaking down this uh, AHA concept in a little bit more detail, sorry, in a lot of detail in the next episode, but that's going to just whet your appetite for what's coming and will get you thinking uh, differently, hopefully, about your own marketing and the need to do this. So we are making great progress. We're, we're nearly there. We've talked about feeding the content monster. Well, you shouldn't create lots of content. Well, you shouldn't be stuck on the hamster wheel of creating lots of content. And how more content is not better. And how most content out there is generic, photocopied, rehashed. That causes prospects to say, oh, that's interesting. Not, oh my God, I need to change right now. I can't believe that what I've been doing is wrong. And this is the cost of doing things wrong. And wow, this new way looks amazing. And I'm already trying the new way and I'm seeing that it's already working. Wow, that company that has these features and benefits that I didn't really care about before, I now suddenly see how those differences matter to me in compelling ways. Wow, they're the only company that I want to deal with now. And that's how you create a category of one business. That's how you create an all roads leading to you situation. That's when you become the customer's only choice. All right, so the last one here that we're going to talk about is uh, essentially cheap offers and the value ladder and how damaging it can be. So mistake number four is the cheap offers and the value ladders. And we've seen a lot of this in recent years. You know, you sell the $27 thing and then there's like a, some kind of an upsell to sell the 99 and then you so on and so forth. So you land and you expand. And I really thought this in my initial business, I thought that this was something that I also needed as well. And Darren illuminated this for me that really this is something I could completely ditch and, and leave. But in the early days, I thought that I must sell something cheap before selling something expensive. It turned out to be a complete fallacy. It was wrong. It was completely fake. And I later learned that the history behind low ticket offers was that it was really there for large companies to offset their ad costs at a very high volume. So when you're still a small business, you can run ads, sell one expensive thing, which is the real thing you want to sell anyway, and make all of it work. You don't need low ticket offers to offset ad costs because your advertising budget isn't that big and you're getting very good results and you're getting early conversions. But once you scale your business, and once you start spending millions of dollars on advertising, what happens is your advertising actually gets much more expensive because the marketplace becomes saturated by your ads. Initially, it creates a lot of customers, but then once people have been overexposed to your marketing for some time, the effectiveness of your advertising drops, meaning that it becomes much more expensive. And that's why these much larger businesses doing multi-million in revenue then introduced the low ticket products in order to break even on their advertising costs, which had gone up. So as a small business who's not advertising using millions of dollars of ad spend, you literally don't need to do this. This was invented by big businesses for big businesses to pay for their ballooning ad costs that naturally happen when you actually uh, when you scale. So it also is not profitable. You probably know this. It's to pay for the, the advertising. So nobody makes any profit worth talking about with low ticket offers. They are literally the self liquidating loss leaders. They also introduce a lot of complexity, a lot of operational drag into the business. And if you are a, um, 
small business, you don't have a huge marketing team, operating these different products, marketing these different products separately, it creates huge workload when really all you want to do is sell the expensive thing that gets the transformation for the customer that actually pr produces good outcomes, that is profitable for you, that you enjoy delivering. And you can make your life a lot easier when you ditch the low ticket uh, fallacy. There's another issue with low ticket offers in that they actually sell to people with more time than money. So they actually appeal to the people who want to do everything themselves as opposed to getting help implementing it or coaching it or getting consulting uh, with that, which means that those people are less likely to ascend to become a high paying customer, which is where a lot of businesses make the majority of their profit. Now, I have tested this myself. I knew this. I tested it in the early days. It didn't work. We also, a few years ago, just to try it again and completely rule it out, we tested it at a very high volume. And also, it created lots and lots of customers, but the ascension rate was not good. And it's what we saw 20 years ago selling these cheap, these cheap products. And the thing is that you want to your offer to appeal to people with more money than time. So if someone has more money than time, are they really going to want to buy something for $27 or $99? Not likely. They don't have the time to actually uh, consume it and implement it. They're too busy and they'd rather just pay someone to get them the outcome and get the transformation. Another issue here is that these low ticket offers, they often cheapen your brand and add this operational drag that I've already explained. So they cheapen your brand you know, Rolex doesn't have a $100 watch or a $50 watch. Their watches cost thousands of dollars. They don't ship away at their at their brand. So that's low ticket offers. That's cheap offers and value ladders and why they're really only applicable for large businesses. And why if you had these, if you have these right now and you're a small business, it's likely adding a lot of operational drag. It's confusing your customers. It's cheapening your brand and it is damaging your ability to actually scale and become profitable. So the solution instead of cheap offers and the value ladder, what we want to do is implement one power offer. One power offer. And I'm going to break down exactly what power offer looks like. Okay. So the power offer is of the idea that you can actually give your best content away for free and you absolutely should because otherwise people have no idea that you're actually good. They see you giving your best, your worst stuff away for free. They just assume you're bad at what you do. So give your best ideas away for free, charge for implementation. And really all we need to do is to sell to the top 1%, the people with more uh, money than time, and then actually get these ideas out to the biggest, widest possible audience. And low ticket offers and cheap offers put barriers between you and your potential customers because the people with more money than time don't buy them. Therefore, they never enter your world. So give it all away for free and then scoop off the top 1% of the highest uh, customers, the highest potential customers with more money than time that really want help implementing and really just appeal to this group of people and create a power offer. So you might ask, well, what is a power offer? Well, a power offer is kind of one thing. It's one offer. It's one outcome, one promise of transformation. Uh, it's essentially one thing, but it is delivered in two different ways. And the two different ways are the first way is it's delivered the expensive way, which is, you know, we implement it with you. It's done with you or maybe it's done for you. And then you actually downsell to the do it yourself version, which ends up being uh, cheaper. So where do you actually uh, how does this work? How do you actually start this off? Well, it, it all comes with a phone call. So rather than selling low ticket products by credit card, you are encouraging people to book a phone call with you. On that phone call, you give them an amazing experience of what it's like to work with you. And then at the end of the call, they're paying to continue the amazing experience that they've already had. And that's what we advocate in Selling Made Human. You'll find inside sellingmadehuman.com some of our sales materials that elaborate on this in a little bit more uh, detail. So what we're trying to do on that call is basically sell the most expensive thing first. So think of this as the descension model. If the if the earlier version with the value ladder is the ascension model, this is the descension model. 
So we try to sell the most expensive thing first, the thing that the customer really needs that gives them the biggest transformation. And then only at the very end of the call, if it's an absolute no, they don't want it and they can't afford it. Then what we do is we downsell and we say, look, why don't you take the do it yourself version? It comes with a course, it comes with a community, and it's really going to help you get the transformation, even though you can't work with me directly. You might do that at the very end of the call, or you wait, might wait for the call to finish and then follow up via email with essentially your downsell offer. So this is a great way then of trying to sell your most expensive thing first, the thing that people actually need, and then downselling from there rather than actually trying to sell very cheap things and ascend into high value customers. This is also a model that is much simpler, to be honest, um, than doing it the other way. It has less operational drag. And this is exactly what Darren showed us to do in our business. We ended up completely changing the business as a result. And I'm going to give you a little look uh, inside that in a second. So we have fixed the saturated formats. We've talked about too many marketing channels. We've talked about feeding the content monster. And we've talked about cheap offers and the value ladders. So this is what happened to me when I implemented this in my business with Darren. I went on essentially to outteach the competition. So instead of feeding the content monster, I created frame breaking insights and content that led to my company. So I didn't lead with my company by pitching it directly with features and benefits. That's what everyone else was doing. Instead, I created thematically linked content that forced prospects to stop in their tracks and think differently about their own situation before I asked them to think differently about my company and how it could help. So we out we did out teaching of the competition and we did it with new formats. And back then people were not offering uh, public workshops. YouTube was practically unheard of back then. And we ended up doing it. And it, we got a massive result from doing YouTube. Okay, so from doing YouTube, putting our content out there in this new format, the in-person meetings, the in-person in -person workshops, the speaking engagements and YouTube led to us growing the business. Then we ended up pivoting as well. And we pivoted from building websites to then actually building early smartphone applications for BlackBerry. So this is even before uh, the iPhone came out. So we had a rapid expansion in the business. We were hiring people so fast, we could barely fit them in the office. We got to design a beautiful office in Dublin, Ireland. This was the dream come true. Talk about the dreams versus reality at the beginning and how those things don't line up. But it was six years. It took six years to do all of this. So it doesn't happen overnight. But we went through a rapid expansion. We ended up getting featured internationally in places like Business Insider, the New York Times, Inc. Magazine, Forbes. I'm now speaking at events. I've lost a lot of my social anxiety, but not all of it. And from there, we started growing. PayPal ended up investing $1.2 million into the business. And from there, we went on to be featured by Business Insider here. You can see I'm being cut off here slightly. As one of the 15 fastest growing startups in the world. And this all came from doing a few things. Instead of using saturated formats, instead we used new formats. Instead of trying too many traction channels at once, we did Google ads that then led people to our content. Instead of feeding the content monster, all of that content that we created was short form content that was frame breaking ahas that led people to think differently about their situation before we ever ask them to do business with us. And instead of selling multiple things at multiple different price points, we created one amazingly powerful offer. And you can do all of this as well. The full process, if you want to learn this, if you want to implement this in your business, you can get it at sellingmadehuman.com. It's a free course. It's a free community. We also have free live events. I'll underline some of this. We have free events, free community, free course. And we give you all of the tools and templates that you get here in the Selling Made Human podcast, including today's sketch file, so that you have this, you can save this, and you can flick through it, make some notes, and look back on some of the concepts that we've discussed. It also comes with a free weekly newsletter. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you go to sellingmadehuman.com to get your bonuses, the sketch, and the course 
that accompanies today's episode. Please also leave a comment below. Let me know what you thought of this. And also, if you have ideas, challenges, problems that you're going through and you want me to address it in a future episode, do leave a comment below on YouTube. I read all of the comments. You can also find us on Twitter and on Instagram. And those links are on sellingmadehuman.com if you want to follow us on social channels. So that's it for today's episode. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've taken value from this and I'll see you in the next one.